Uh, I'm James Page with uh, Canadian Wildlife Federation. I'm the Species at Risk and Biodiversity Specialist. Um, I was going to start that later on when uh, when I when I jumped in. I wasn't thinking about it just now. Um, so yeah, I do a, a number of things at, at CWF um, related to species at risk mostly, um, but as well, I lead a, um, a lot of our efforts on citizen science, which iNaturalist is a huge part of. Um, so as I was saying, if you get cut off, please try and rejoin. Uh, I'll start the webinar back up again and we'll pick up where we were. Um, if you're having problems with audio or anything like that, just you know, check your microphone settings, your speaker settings, sorry, um, first and, and your um, within within Zoom to make sure you've got sound coming through that way. Um, for the chat, we're gonna try and use that only for um, kind of technical things like sound or video not coming through. Um, I want to um, just basically use that for that. For um, questions and that kind of stuff, uh, we'll use the Q&A um, down that you'll see at the bottom of, of Zoom and you can ask your questions in that way. Um, we'll be compiling them as we go, but uh, I'll try and uh, we'll wait till the end to answer most of those. Um, Caitlin, I think you have your video on. I don't know if you can turn it off because I think I'm not being seen. Oh, no, I am. Okay, we're all good. Um, all's good. Uh, okay, so, um, so yeah, Caitlin will help us out along the way um, and along with any technical stuff as we go. Um, so CWF, uh, just a little bit about us, we're one of Canada's largest conservation organizations um, undertaking projects and conservation across the country. Uh, our mission is to conserve and inspire the conservation of uh, Canada's wildlife and habitats. Um, we do this in a number of ways. One is through engaging public and youth in citizen science, like I'm going to be talking about now with iNaturalist Canada. Um, also with education programs like Wild Outside and the Canadian Conservation Corps. Uh, and then we have specific projects and conservation work in um, freshwater, marine, and terrestrial environments, uh, many of which target species at risk, like the right whale, Blanding's turtles, uh, at-risk bats, and monarch butterfly. Um, just going to pause to see if you have chats coming through. Uh, yeah, everything is all good. Um, just wanted to check in on that as we're going. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about is with uh, iNaturalist and um, CWF uh, leads uh, iNaturalist in Canada, uh, iNaturalist Canada, uh, along with partners at um, Parks Canada, uh, Nature Surf Canada, and the Royal Ontario Museum. Um, our organizations form what we um, what's called the iNaturalist Canada Steering Committee. So we help kind of manage the the platform here in Canada. Um, and in Canada, um, we have a Canadian version of iNaturalist. iNaturalist exists across the world and within Canada, we can search and, and all these databases, it's, it's kind of one backend database. Um, so if you're uh, wanting to, if you're curious about what's uh, been observed in South Africa, and even if there's not an iNaturalist instance there, you can search observations through the iNaturalist.ca platform um, anywhere in the world. Um, iNaturalist is run out of the United States um, as iNaturalist.org, uh, run by the California Academy and um, National Geographic. Um, there are now about 15 uh, countries that have their own version of iNaturalist like we do here in Canada, and there's a few more coming on board. So just to give a sense of kind of the global um, positioning and the, the situation with iNaturalist around the world. Um, and I will... Uh, talk about our platform here in Canada. Um, it basically is um, a database of observations of things that people like all of us, uh, anybody has uh, come across a wildlife observation, um, can record it using the app or a digital or a smart uh, digital camera um, and upload it through to iNaturalist.ca. Um, I gave the, this talk about two weeks ago and I, I had to update this slide. Two weeks ago there were uh, just over 4.4 million observations uh, in two weeks. We've got another 100 million or 100,000, so we're up to 4.5 million observations and counting. So it jumps pretty quick. Uh, I'm going to lead in now with a uh, video that talks a little bit about iNaturalist, um, about what it is, and uh, hopefully give you a bit of a sense of it that way. You can help make a difference for wildlife conservation by building a living record of where species you encounter are found and adding to a growing database of our biodiversity. Every photo of a plant, animal, 
fungus, or track, and sound recording you make through iNaturalist Canada can be used to locate species at risk, track invasive species, locate hotspots for wildlife road mortality, rediscover species that were once thought extinct, and much more. You don't need to be an expert to join iNaturalist. Everyone is welcome to join in. Starting from your first observation, an auto-identification will instantly make species suggestions for you of what you just photographed. The best part is that after making an observation, there are species experts that will help identify the species you got. See what others have posted in your area. Get to know what's living around you. It's more than an app. It's an online community. It's not all about taking pictures or sound recordings. You can engage with experts and gain insightful information on species you're observing. You can follow friends to see what they're logging and even message each other through the platform. Look for cool projects to join. Interested in turtles? There's a project for that. What about birds you see at your feeder? Or all things living in a particular area of your city? Start recording observations through the free iNaturalist app or online at iNaturalist.ca. You never know, you could find new species never before seen in Canada, like the painted hen mudbug. Join iNaturalist Canada today. Okay, so that's just a little snapshot of, of Probo kind of advertisement of what iNaturalist kind of is. Uh, it shows a little bit about the, how it kind of plays out in the field or out, outside. App and the website. Um, you can check out iNaturalist.ca slash help. Um, there's a bunch of resources there that, that can help you along the way. So basically, iNaturalist is a citizen science platform, and there's a few things it can do. And, and uh, the last webinar was about keeping track of, of your observations and sharing it with others and how to record observations. Essentially, it's to become and to be a citizen science where this data can be um, useful for conservation and the idea is to make this data useful for conservation but also to just engage with with nature. Um, what I'm going to talk mostly about now though is we're looking at this other side of things which is the the after the data gets into this um, these identification side so it's kind of it's a two two-way crowdsourcing. So we're, we're kind of crowdsourcing observational data that can be used for conservation, but we're also crowdsourcing, basically meaning getting as many people um, or encouraging as many people as we can to help identify things. Um, so this is the other aspect. So the way the data is most useful to conservation is that, that we actually can put a name to the species that was recorded. Um, and as great opinion and a, and a kind of more reliable way of, of um, being sure that that observation or that species is what we what someone thinks it is and it can be confirmed by others. Um, it adds credibility to an observation, um, especially when it comes time to incorporate into conservation decisions. Um, so when we're thinking about identifying, if, if especially for those of us that maybe aren't experts, um, a good place to start is just looking at observations in your area. So you can do this um, through iNaturals.ca if you go to the Explore tab, and we'll kind of look at what the website looks like in a little bit. Um, this is essentially the database that, that uh, the video and that I was talking about before. Um, you can uh, browse this database. Um, and to, to zoom into your local area to kind of get a sense of what the most common things are maybe that are being seen in your area. Um, and it'll help you out kind of when it comes to, to identify, you already have a sense of what might be what might be living around. So when you click on the filters tab, brings up this little um, option for, for filters. Um, and if you'll notice that uh, verifiable is checked, that means that the, the observation has a photo um, or some sort of evidence, so photo or sound of, of what was recorded, um, but also has a location and a date associated to it. Um, there's a bunch of different categories here. You can search by um, species group. Um, Hi, James. Can I cut in for one second? Yeah, for sure. Hey, Caitlin. <laughs> yes, uh, sorry, our internet is not working today. Um, your video is frozen and you were cutting in and out. I was wondering if you could just turn your video on, off, sorry, and turn it back on. 
And we'll yeah, see if that thanks, works. Man. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're just getting it working. It looks like the internet's a little choppy on our end. If you can just bear with us for one moment. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm back. Sorry about that, everyone. Caitlin had issues with her internet, and now uh, mine just went down for a second. So good thing that we were both logged in here that it didn't end the meeting for everyone, uh, which is exactly why we do these kinds of things. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back and share my screen now. And start my video again. Hopefully that doesn't uh, slow things down. Here we go. Um, Yes, it looks like it's working much better now. You're not frozen. Uh, can someone send us a message letting us know if we, you can hear us and everything's working? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it looks like it's all good. Getting lots of good messages. <laughs> getting lots of messages. Great, <laughs> thanks everyone. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen again. And get this. Uh, there we go. And my presentation's coming up here. Sorry about that, everyone. Bear with us. There we go. Got it back. Okay. Um, thanks, Caitlin. If anything else happens from the video, I'll shut it back off again just to um, just to avoid that. Uh, okay. So um, yes, filters. Uh, we can filter by a whole bunch of uh, different options here, and you can even search by date range. So if you're curious of what's being seen uh, in the spring, say this time of year, uh, you can check back on the dates from the same time last year. Uh, you can also search by project, and this is where our City Nature Challenge um, is gonna be coming into play. So if you're wanting to help out with the City Nature Challenge, even if you're not in a participating city, you can help identify things. and. Um, Typing in the project name in this uh, search bar will bring up just the observations from the City Nature Challenge. Um, notice how uh, there's a research grade option. So if you're looking to find um, species that have already been identified, um, that might help you out if you're still kind of getting used to things. Um, chances are things that are already re are research grade have, have uh, already been confirmed. So chances are that the ID is, is more likely uh, correct. Um, so as you zoom in on the database uh, on the on the map, you will see little points markers come up. Um, each of these are color coded by kind of species group. So, uh, for example, reptiles and amphibians are in blue, plants are in green, um, and so on. So you can can kind of tell what those um, species groups are. Uh, then when you come and you click on a marker, something like this pops up where you have the observation. Um, uh, a little few details about the observation. If you click on the observation itself it brings up to that observation page itself. 
obviously this isn't the smooth green snake, this is a different observation, but I wanted to kind of chat about what an observation is. And I think knowing what an observation is and some of the components will be um, better off for helping to identify things. Um, so, um, so the I mentioned a verifiable observation it has to have a date and a location, but also some sort of evidence of what was found. Um, and I'll probably say this again, but the better the evidence is, the more likely a spe an observation is going to be uh, well identified or easy, more easily identified. So if the photo is better and has captured some of those distinguishing features, um, then it's much more likely to be um, accurately identified by others. Um, so there are a couple of research or of, of data quality, what it's called. So as you see on the top of this one here up in the green, it's called research grade. That means um, at least somebody else has, a, has agreed with this identification. Um, I'm the one who posted this observation. I called this a Leatherwood, somebody else agreed. Um, and it kind of bumps it up to uh, what's called research grade. It, loose, it, it works on a two thirds majority. So if somebody else disagrees, it brings that back down to more of a, a what's called casual grade or needs identification uh, level. So it's kind of it's kind of a moving, moving target in that sense. Um, Notice how in this one there's a green pin, like round marker with a stem on it, so it's actually attached to the ground. Um, not all observations are uh, the location like that is is as is precise because of some species that are um, what we call subject to persecution or harm. So meaning some species in Canada are collected for pet trade, are harvested uh, like medicinal plants, are um, overloved in some cases, over observed, and it can cause um, um, Kind of harm or, or flight of that individual. Um, and so these ones are what we call obscured observation. Um, obscured, uh, this relates to the geo privacy, which basically means how that uh, is displayed on a map. So in this case with the blending turtle, um, we see that this marker is a round um, point here inside this big box. Um, so with this actual observation was observed somewhere within this box that kind of continues down a little ways there. Um, we can't see on the map. Um, just to prevent that true location from being known. Um, and if you're not in the observation page, they appear like these ones here, which is basically a round circle, a round dot, without that stem, it's not locked to the ground. Um, just a note of caution, if you're concerned and you look at your own observations and you see your Blanding's turtles and it looks like it's, it's visible, you can see always see the pin of your own observation. So it won't look obscured like this to yourself. So don't get freaked out if, if uh, it looks to yourself that, that that observation, that true location is known. Um, another thing about um, the uh, locations, um, if you click on the details here, um, this is what comes up. So this is this explains why the geo uh, why the coordinates are obscured, and this is because certain species are automatically obscured in iNaturalist. Um, up here, though, it does show that the geo privacy is open. That means that the person making the observation didn't manually choose to hide it. It still gets automatically hidden because of the, the it's on one of the, the it's one of the species that is automatically hidden in iNaturalist, but um, this just basically means that the the observer himself, I think it was he, um, didn't hide it. That's an option when we make an observation. If you want to be extra cautious and you could actually hide them yourself, it just means for species that are um, maybe not at risk of collection and those are hidden, the 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 um, the observation and and that information is a little less. Um, harder to use for conservation because we don't know the actual location of that and it can't be used for other uh, people looking at species nearby. Um, so um, I think that, yeah, so that's all I was gonna say about that. Um, a few things about the uh, research grade up here. Um, as I mentioned, two, th two thirds a uh, majority have to agree with a, an identification to bring it up to what's called research grade. Um, but it's a little more nuanced than that. Uh, so if you come here, you see the community taxon. This basically means that the community agrees with the species. And we see that there's five identifications and we're definitely over the two thirds threshold um, to call this a blending turtle. But if you click on what's this, um, it brings up a little bit more nuanced information. This is only part of the full screenshot, but it explains how this works. Um, Basically, it's a, an algorithm or a, a calculation that will show um, the percentage and, and uh, or the, the ratio of who agrees and how many people agree with this observation. So in all of these, all the cases, the people that agreed with this observation did agree it's a blending turtle. But if someone else said, oh, you know what, I think that's just um, a box turtle, 
um, then it may bring it up to here where um, this person would then have a disagree that it's a blandings turtle and it might actually just call the species um, uh, pond and box turtles, for example. Um, so just to say it's a bit more nuanced and if you're ever interested in why an observation is research grade versus not, you can always click on the what's this, um, this here and it'll bring up that information, those details for you. Um, and if you scroll down on the observation, so when we're getting into identifications now, um, you um, will see, you can actually identify, you can agree with, or suggest an identification from right here, from the species uh, page itself, from the observation page itself. So you can click on agree if you agree if it's a blandings turtle. If you think it's something else, you can start typing a species name. If you click on the species name um, field, it will bring up the image recognition software. So this is a computer algorithm that is surprisingly really good to provide suggestions of what that species is. And I'll talk a bit later about why we don't wanna just blindly trust that every time, but it is quite good. Um, should mention everything I've done up to now, you can do without having an account on an actress. You can browse, you can search, um, but as soon as you try and wanna make an identification, then you'd have to sign in. So if you click on the species tab and you haven't signed in, it will basically prompt you to sign into an iNaturalist account. So you can write the species in and it, it, uh, it'll bring you back to the, 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 that same species page. Um, so here's kind of how identifications play out, um, just as an example. So here, this is somebody uh, posted this observation as a midland painted turtle. Um, uh, somebody else wrote in saying, you know, I don't think this is a midland painted turtle, but I'm not sure what it is. I know it's turtle, like this group of turtles, but I'm not quite sure. So they disagree that it's a midland painted turtle and just kind of went as a broader version of turtles. Um, the next person comes in, uh, Turtle Helper, and says, well, you know, I'm pretty sure these, this is a slider, um, but again, was, it was in the slider genus, but I wasn't quite sure which um, species of slider it is, which is a non-native species, um, which is understandable why people may not have thought to, to call it a, a slider to begin with. Um, and these comments here, which are helpful to kind of explain why they think, uh, justify why you think it's a certain way, and uh, why it's a certain species, I should say. Um, and then a few other people chimed in and say, you know, we think this is a common slider as opposed to a right-eared slider. Um, and then it, enough, when you get to that number, there's four that agreed it's a common slider. Um, you're getting up to those two thirds majority, which pushes us up to research grade. Um, now, if somebody else comes in and says, you know what, I don't think it's a common slider, I think it's a right-eared slider, that may move it back down and actually change the um, kind of what shows up in iNaturalist just, as, just to the grouping of sliders until somebody else comes in and, and helps out. So that's kind of like a real life example of how these, how these kind of identifications play out. Um, I'm gonna go through and try another video and hopefully this doesn't <laughs> freeze everything again um, on uh, something that iNaturalist.org put together on how the identify page works uh, on iNaturalist and um, some fun little saloon music that they put in the background. So let me go to my presentation and we go back into here. And okay, here we go. And I'm going to jump ahead a little bit at one point to skip over some quick a section that doesn't really uh, talk about keyboard shortcuts.
Okay. <laughs> um, so if the, the saloon music wasn't too distracting, hopefully you kind of got the gist of how the identify page works. Um, I'm going to bring back up my presentation here. There we go. Um, okay, so I'm going to walk through some some actual uh, some real examples to kind of get a feel of it, and and hopefully everybody's paying attention because I'm because I'm going to try and get you to to do a little work for me here in a little bit. Um, so this is again a screenshot of the of the identify page. So um, you see identify anywhere in our naturals. This top bar um, shows up anywhere you go once you log into our well even before you log into our naturalist, but you won't see the identify option until you log in. So um, that might be why you wouldn't be seeing that if you're wondering what's going on. So if you click the identify page, it brings you up to a page like this, which um, the default is all, this, all the observations that don't have, that are not research grade. So notice how some do have a species name already written in, but um, uh, this means that nobody else has agreed yet with this identification or someone puts it in as unknown and actually doesn't know what the species is. So just like the uh, explore um, area, there's a filters option here. Um, and you can filter by pretty much the same things we could before with uh, when looking at uh, exploring observations. Um, again, we can search by project and help identify things from the City Nature Challenge, for example. Um, if you search that right now, just as an, as an aside, you won't see anything because it hasn't started yet. So it starts on Friday, so there's no observations yet associated with the Saving Nature Challenge. Um, you can search by species group, um, which is helpful uh, if you know something better than others. Um, and you can search by, again, by date. Um, and so we're going to start, I'm going to start here with some unknown species. So these are things that people have submitted to our naturalist that they didn't put uh, any name to. So if you click here, this little question mark, that's unknown, and that will filter to just species, and you can see all the lists, the names here are, are unknown. The observers didn't know what it was, so they just left it blank. Um, and so this is a good place to start, even if you're new, especially maybe if you're new um, to identifying things, and, and I'll, I'll, you'll see why in a second here. So let's start with this first one here. Um, uh, I guess everybody can probably see that. That's looks to me like a bird. Um, if you click on it, um, you get uh, you get this species identification window that pops up that that video talked about, and it looks like this. Um, when you click on um, so here, if you know what this is, right off, you can click here and add an add an identification. Um, if you're not or a comment, if you're not so sure what it is, you can click uh, suggestions, and this is where the image recognition software comes into play. And here's exactly why we don't want to blindly trust this image recognition software because it's picking up the branches here in the foreground, thinking it's maybe a spider, uh, maybe a fly. Um, so it's obviously not at all right. Um, one thing to note with the, the, the uh, output of the image recognition software, there's a few sources options. Um, I tend to use visually similar, which means it uses an algorithm to find species that are very similar. There's a couple other options if you click on this little drop drop down uh, tab beside this to um, search uh, compare it compare that would have the software compare it to um, uh, nearby observations. So if you can search by observations, it can compare it to just research grade observations. So these are only compared to other observations that have been confirmed um, and or checklists for a given area. So this one is sort of, sort of by visually similar. And um, obviously these, as I said, <laughs> aren't right. Um, so here's uh, what you can do is, uh, even if you don't know what this is, we're pretty confident it's a bird. Um, so you can go back to info and just write in big, um, birds, for example. Um, this is helpful, even, even if it just seems mundane that like obvious that's a bird, but um, species experts will often search and filter by the species group that they know. So if uh, an ornithologist is looking at helping to identify things, and they search as we have shown you to do by species group, um, just for birds, this observation will never come up unless somebody else goes in and calls it a bird and then it will come up. And then, so that helps kind of triage these observations for species experts to um, get them into a, a more um, likely or credible identification. So it is helpful even if you only know it's a bird. Um, as you get as, uh, if you can get as specific as you can, like in this case, I started writing in perching birds, so like songbirds or perching birds, um, 
it can get even more a bit more specific because this is this is a songbird um, and it'll help get it a little bit more specific even if you don't know what species exactly it is. Now the other thing you can do here um, uh, is click this view button as you start typing something in and you think it's a bird or um, in this case if I think it's a song sparrow you can write start writing that in you click view that'll bring you to a species page which will have more photos you can search through a few other photos it shows you this seasonality of when it's most observed in, during the year and it's kind of cut off in this image but you can see the range map of that species which will help also help give you a bit of information on on what species that is um, so that's helpful um, to uh, help your, help you identify what that species might be. Um, so then you can go back to your observation. Um, once you click your your um, species that you uh, think it is, even if you just call it perching birds, you click save, and it brings you. It'll close that window and bring you back to the main um, identification page. Um, I'm going to try again with another example and here's where I'm going to get some help from the rest of you if this all goes well um, to uh, go to our naturalist in a real life real-time example and hopefully the internet all holds up here so um, this is live on a naturalist uh, you'll notice that you don't see the identify option up here it's because I'm not signed in so I'm gonna log in hopefully thinking cat So here we go. So now I see identify. I'm going to go through to identify something. And I'm going to search for, still thinking, showing no observations, but still thinking about it. Um, I'm going to do search for something in a project. CWF also has another project called Observation Nation. So if I start typing that in, it comes up here. I can update search and it's going to show everything within Observation Nation within that project. The other thing I want to do right now just as to help with examples is I'm going to click research grade so that um, these are going to bring up observations with probably better photos. So this is kind of also a recommendation to think about when you're taking a photo or a reminder when you're taking a photo of an observation if you take better photos they're more likely to get identified um, more um, more accurately and more often. Um, so here's research grade observations. They all have much better photos. Um, and I'm gonna search for turtles. I'm gonna find a good observation for everyone to help me out with here. So let's look at this one here. Everyone can see that. Um, and I think this is Mary's observation who might actually is quite likely listening in on this observation. So we're going to help her out at the same time. So notice how this has already been agreed with. There's one comment here, one identification here. These are research grade observations, right? So somebody else has confirmed this. Um, it's helpful still to do that because two people could be wrong. I know Mary's not, but um, two people could be wrong on the same observation and then it's considered research grade and uh, it's kind of erroneously qualified as that. So here's the first step if we want to identify something and it's a good photo like this, like Mary's got, um, and um, we can uh, click agree if we think this is, uh, if we agree with what this is. So I'm going to get everybody's opinion and see if this comes up. You should see a poll here and I'm asking everyone, do you agree with this identification? Yes or no? And I spelled identification wrong. Great. <laughs> So we're going to see how many people um, agree with this uh, straight off the bat. And I see people are filling this in. This is great. So we're getting some ID help from what 50, 60 people here on one observation. This is great. So I'll give you a couple, uh, another 10 seconds or so for people to add in what they think. All right, so we've got a, a good 100 people now have already agreed, and the vast majority says, yes, this is a painted turtle. Some have said no, and I kind of wonder if maybe because you're noticing some of these are calling them Eastern painted turtles, um, which 
you couldn't know otherwise if you didn't know where this location is. And I, I know this happens to be on the east coast of Canada. So the only species of painted turtle around there would be Eastern painted. Um, if we call this painted turtle, uh, researchers would know if it's in that area that it would be uh, a painted turtle, uh, an Eastern painted. Um, I'm going to go ahead and agree with this. And I'm taking everybody's uh, good word and good identification skills on this. So here we go. So I've agreed with this. All right, and I can mark it as reviewed, so then it doesn't come back up again uh, in my um, in my searches when I go to uh, identify other things. Reviewed, and I think it didn't quite agree. Took a second there. Yeah. Okay. Great. That's great. That worked out quite well. Um, Oh, the other thing I should have mentioned, that poll was anonymous, so I should have mentioned that before everybody submitted that nobody's name came up associated with that, so you didn't have to feel nervous about <laughs> what you were what you were agreeing to. Um, another, another example I want to give um, is looking up here. So I'm going to go back to filters, and I'm going to filter for birds. So this is only going to bring up birds. And of course, nothing comes up because turtles and tortoises are not birds. I'm going to look for finches. There we go. So I'm going to scroll through. We're going to look for a good finch um, observation. Let's look at this one here. So now instead of agreeing with this right from the get go, although that is a really good photo that we can probably identify from, I'm going to click on this, which brings up our species card and we can zoom in on this. I mean, if it happens to be a, a far away observation, we can zoom right in um, uh, to get a better view of, especially for plants, sometimes it's, it's better. We need to kind of get a closer look. Now, a couple of people have already agreed uh, that this is a purple finch. Um, I am going to um, look at a couple of other things within the species card. Remember the, the video talked about annotations. So we can look at this, annotations can help um, just kind of provide extra information to an observation. So alive or dead, we can collect, I assume this is alive unless it's a really good taxidermy job. Um, life stage, this is an adult and uh, a male. So we've added a bit of extra information to all this. Uh, the data quality, this is where, um, where things come to become um, can be pushed down to like a casual observation. If we look at this and be like, this location is obviously wrong and we vote it down, or if the um, evidence isn't there, we can vote it down. And then it kind of pushes that observation back away from being research grade into what's called more casual observation. Um, I'm gonna go through and look at the suggestions again. Um, notice how this here, um, again, is sorted by observation. So this is only showing nearby observations. Um, I want to, I'm going to search for uh, visually similar. I should mention, um, I do see some hands going up. Um, I think we'll try and wait to the end if people can keep their questions there. Although if you want to write something specific in the chat related to like something that needs better explanation right now, um, maybe write it in the Q and A and Caitlin, if you, um, if you can, you can kind of interject and, and kind of mention that to me right off the bat so I can I can address that now or as we go even right now. Um, okay, so uh, so these are the suggestions based on um, visually similar observations. So if you see on the right here too, this pulls up the range map of um, the species that is talking about, the purple finch. If you look down here, Cassin's finch, not quite in the same vicinity and Another species that is often misidentified with this one is the house finch, and you see the range, it's, it's pretty close. It could be definitely around there. So um, with that information, I also wanna say one other thing, um, something that can often be misidentified as a uh, purple finch, if we look at this, could be the common red pole. Depending on, oops. Uh, birder expertise. So if I start writing this in, again, you see how we can go to view, I can click on this and it'll bring up the species page for a uh, common red pole. 
not quite the same, but you can see how someone can miss, make, make an honest mistake. Um, but you could click on other observations um, or other um, images, see when it's been seen, um, and get extra information that way. So I'm going to get everybody to help me out again. Um, I'm going to launch another poll. And I'm going to see. I guess I have to. There you go. So this should come up again for everybody. Oops, I just closed that. Apologies. Um, so you can think about this while I get my screen back up here. Um, so what bird do you think that is? Those are a few of the options that I had given out and uh, I'm going to put my uh, biology credibility in all of your hands and we'll see what, uh, what we get. So we'll go back to identify. Give you guys, this is good timing because you guys have a few minutes to think about it. I was in observation nation, so I'll do that again so we can find it more easily. So we've got a good vast majority of everybody also agrees with the original ID and think it's purple finch. If you think it's house, house finch, which is quite possible, that is another one that is could very well be around there. Um, and I'm not seeing that observation now. Oh, it's because I didn't select research grade, look at that. So it was not showing any research grade observations by default. There we go. There we go. So I'm going to agree with everybody here. And we can either add an ID and write it in, or um, we can go back up to where it was right here. And we just click Agree. And we've all agreed that we've got a, a purple finch. Um, we can use these arrows to kind of just quickly flip through different um, observations uh, to help identify things as we go. Uh, or you can click on the X and just click on uh, an observation the way we did just that last time. Uh, okay, I'm gonna bring back my presentation. Let's get it going here. And I'm gonna quickly go through, so all this can also be done uh, in, the, in the app um, through the iNaturalist app. Um, I don't tend to use it as much in the app, but uh, I do hear that some people, well, I should close that poll, I guess. I hope that didn't, there we go. And I think everybody can close that if it still happens to be on your screen, you can click the X and get rid of that poll. Um, so yeah, some people do prefer to use their app if they got their phone handy and want to do a uh, quick Few quick uh, identifications. So um, again, you can open up the iNaturalist app. Um, when you open up the app, if you're not already signed in, you can sign in and it brings you to this kind of a page where um, this is your, your observations page. If you go and click on these three bars in the menu, you'll see this kind of an option. If you click explore, it'll bring up the observations that are near, near you and it uses your location. Uh, right here is showing by my location, things that are kind of somewhat near me. If you want to click on the filters button here on the top right, um, you have kind of the same filters that we just got, had gone through with the identification. So you have, um, you can uh, hide your observations if you don't want to see yours in amongst all the ones that you're looking to help identify. You can search by project, you can click research grade only or just needs ID, um, apply the filters and it brings up the observations that meet your parameters. 
if you want to help identify, click on you tap, not click at this point, um, tap on a, an observation, and it brings up that observation kind of page of what it is. And if you right off here, you won't see an option to identify. So what you have to do to identify is you tap these three, like the comment box here. So you tap there, and from there you can just you can tap agree um, if you have enough to go on with that um, image, or you can tap on suggest an identification suggest an ID um, and that brings up uh, this other page and when you tap on it it's this is using the image recognition software the same one that's used on iNaturals.ca um, but you do need a data connection with your phone to be able to do this so you either have to have data on your phone or be uh, on Wi-Fi to use this now it's saying again it's pretty sure it's in this genus if we think it's pulmonaria officinalis we can tap on the check mark we think if it's just lung warts and we're not sure enough, we can just we can agree to the, the kind of more higher level uh, identification um, and tap the check mark there. So once we tap the check mark, it's going to ask, do you want to add this identification? Check again there, and we've added our ID. When you click back uh, from that little arrow on the observations, it brings you back. Oh, I didn't have an extra screen. It just brings you back to this main screen like that of all the other observations, and you can move on to the next one. That's uh, identifying how to use the kind of the functionality in a, in a naturalist in a nutshell. Um, how this ties into the upcoming city nation challenge, which is launching on Friday, is that um, right now there's so there's 25 cities participating in Canada. Um, basically, it's a global initiative to record as many observations as we can around the world in about four short days. So Friday to Monday. Um, and but from Friday through to the 9th, um, we, we need everybody's help to help identify what was observed during the City Nature Challenge. So if you happen to live in one of these 25 cities, great, get out and uh, use the iNaturalist app or your um, smart or digital camera to uh, take photos and upload to iNaturalist.ca. Um, if you're in a city, participating city, automatically get added. Um, and um, if you're not in a participating city, we can use everybody's help in identifying. Um, so the, the idea of the, of the City Nation Challenge, so it's a global initiative. There's about, I think over 400 cities participating across the globe. Last year, we had nearly a million observations observed around the world uh, during these four days. And we're kind of um, tying together all the Canadian cities to, um, to kind of in a friendly competition, but more as a collaboration to see how many observations we can record from Friday uh, to Monday. Um, if you're not sure about how to record an observation using iNaturalist, you can check out some of our help videos on at iNaturalist.ca slash help. Um, or you can visit our webinar that I gave two weeks ago. It's recorded. And you can find that if you go to CanadianWildlifeFederation.ca and you search in the uh, resources tab at the top, you'll see webinars and you can, you'll be able to find our webinar that way. Um, and it gives an hour long presentation on how to use the app and the website to upload observations. Um, and I know with the, the global pandemic, obviously, we don't want to be um, encouraging anybody doing anything that's not safe and that we're not within regulations. But uh, so iNaturalist can be something that can be done um, locally as, as needed, uh, depending on what area of the country you're in. Um, you can do within your backyards, local green spaces, local streets, um, biking and walking paths. If you're able to go further afield up into um, hiking trails and that kind of stuff. Um, and even within your own home, uh, surprisingly, how many critters we can find uh, in our basements and uh, the number of spiders I let outside uh, at our house too. So um, nature can be found everywhere. Uh, it can also be done, it's something that can be done in family bubbles as well, right? You don't have to do it, you can be done alone, but also uh, family bubbles or in, in those areas where small gatherings are allowed. Um, and as I said, from April 30th to May 9th, um, everybody across the country can help identify what was found. Um, so remember how we searched in the identify page. Uh, you can search for a city nature challenge um, and find the Canada one. Or if you're in one of the cities and you want to just help identify um, observations in that one city, you can search for the city project itself. Um, another way to get to that as well is through um, the iNaturals project. So if you go, remember the top bar here, um, we talked about for where they identify is if you click on community, there's an option for projects. When you go through to projects, the I uh, the City Nature Challenge, the Canada wide one will show up as one of the top ones. So you can you can click fr from there to the project. Um, and if you click on read more, there'll be a link 
just to those observations in that identify section of just the observations for the City Nature Challenge to help identify. Um, so that's how all of us can help, uh, regardless of where we are in Canada or even beyond. Um, and the more observations that we have identified in the in the City Nature Challenge projects, the more species will show up in our total tally. So um, uh, the observations all count, but we, we, the more that are identified, we'll get uh, we'll get our species count up a bit higher too. Um, so with that, uh, we get a little bit of time for some questions at the end. Um, and if you're looking for extra information, um, inashos.ca slash help, or for the City Nature Challenge, you can check out citynaturechallenge.ca. And if Caitlin, you're still on with your internet, it's good. Oh, awesome. Um, yes. There are a lot of questions, I think, in hands coming up throughout. So hopefully uh, um, you can address some of those and able to compile a few for me. Yeah, so we've got a question about captive and cultivated. Oh, yeah. Uh, for example, we planted a uh, acre of wildflower meadow and I'm using iNaturalist to ID what's coming up. Are these classed as cultivated? Oh, that's very specific. Um, I feel like this might have been the same one from last uh, last webinar. I was talking about captive and cultivated versus like naturalized versus um, kind of just garden plants. Um, Generally, and I had a note to talk about this in, in part of the presentation about captive and cultivated. Um, basically, if it was intentionally put there, um, we're calling those things captive and cultivated. Now, seeding a wildflower me meadow, yeah, that's a restoration action more so. I that I would lean more towards leaving that as wild, um, especially since, especially if it's a wildflower meadow and it's native seed and it's kind of what would the type of habitat that should naturally already be there. That kind of thing, I, I would be say it's a bit of a gray area, but um, I would say that could be considered more wild. The captive and cultivated things generally, we're thinking more like garden plants, um, trees that were planted in a yard, or things at the zoo, like those types of things. Um, now, if it's garden escapee, like you happen to have a patch of, um, I don't know, bishop's weed or um, wild garlic or something that's gotten out from someone else's garden or whatever, then that, if it's once it's back in, established in the wild, I would consider that. Uh, wild and not captive or cultivated. Great, thank you. Uh, we also have a few questions about um, re-observing re the same individuals. So for example, if you have a robin that lives in your yard, should you keep uh, uploading observations? Yeah, and I, I, it is a, I, I have the same thing. I have robins in my yard and I don't take one every day. Um, but uh, I would suggest kind of the first thing, some, something notable, like the first robin of the year, um, the first flowering instance, um, maybe a nesting event of a robin, um, and, and kind of periodically throughout the year, if you like. Um, uh, I, would, I would suggest that as opposed to every single day, but it's, you, you can. Um, it's good to capture these common things, which sometimes people overlook because they're like, they see it all the time. Um, and then it looks like there's no, there are no robins recorded on iNaturalist, for example. So which isn't the case, but. Great, thank you. Um, and a, another question on that note was about, if you see multiple individuals of the same species, should you do separate observations for each of them? Yeah, um, I would tend to do, if it's the same species, I would tend to do one observation, try and get a good photo that, I mean, if it's a group, be it, have one that you can pick out the identifying features of, and then you can add in your comments section, like the number of individuals you saw. Um, you can add 15 observations of the same species of different individuals. I mean, that's up to you, but um, a simpler thing may be to just uh, make a note of it in the comments. And someone brought up something that I'm not too familiar with, so you might be able to answer this, James, is saying the range map no longer shows on iNaturalist, uh, just the link to Wikipedia. Uh, is there a way to check the range now? Hmm. Um, depending, so the range map should still be there. Um, when you go to the species page in the view, it, I think the default landing page is the Wikipedia information, but there's a few, there are a few tabs like um, map and uh, taxa info. Um, so I think a few of those tabs, if you click through, you should still be able to see the range maps. And those are based on kind of observations within our naturalist, how they develop those range maps. So I think they should be there still. Great. Uh, and we have another one about Seek. Uh, do you recommend using the Seek app to post to iNaturalist? 
Yeah. And the Seek is great for kids, especially. And my kids you love it and they're trying to get into iNaturals, but I'm getting them to learn a little bit more on Seek first. Um, so yeah, there is a way to create uh, a linked account so you can post from Seek through to iNaturalist. Um, the benefit of Seek is especially for youth that um, you don't want to have a create uh, create an account with pers any personal information. Um, so it's great for that. Um, the, def the, the drawback is that then you can't have that same kind of dialogue and interaction of a uh, species identification and then kind of that back and forth of like, here's why I think this is it's a certain species and what's why it's this other species. So um, there's pros and cons to both. I generally would say for especially young people that um, if you don't want to create a, an account with personal information, then I would suggest seek. Um, if you're, if it's, that's not the case, I would, I would definitely encourage iNaturalist. The benefit of seek though, is that it does use the, it had the image recognition software works offline. The problem with it is it's not as good as the online version because it's got to be compacted and taken offline into a, into an app. So it's not as good and accurate as iNaturalist is. Great. That's awesome. Thank you. I, uh, I have a question here. If you find a spider in your house, is that captive? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't call those captive. It wasn't intentionally put there unless you're hoarding spiders. So I, I would still call that wild. And how useful is taking multiple photos and adding them to one observation? Mm, yeah, definitely useful. Um, and I, I tend to when I can, unless I know like I've captured really good features with, features with one photo. Um, the more uh, photos within an observation that help identify it, the better. And this kind of ties into identifying, right? If you're thinking, if you, I guess if you think like an identifier when you're taking an observation, um, think of like, am I going to be able to look at this after the fact and tell what that species is from this photo? And oftentimes for certain things, you need multiple photos and multiple angles, um, something of like the underside of a leaf versus the stem. Um, you need a few of those pieces of information to help identify things. Great. And for this weekend, do we need to add our photos to the CNC projects or will they be automatically? Uh, yeah, no, they're automatically added. If you're in a participating city, so if you go to the, the City Nature Challenge project, and I had that list there on the on the presentation, but if you go to uh, within our natural search projects, you can get to the City Nature Challenge one. Um, it'll list the participating cities. So if you're in one of those boundaries of a participating city, it'll get automatically added. So you don't have to join the project. The benefit of joining, though, is that if the, the project organizers have interesting finds to share with people or some, some kind of event or, or noteworthy thing to mention, then, then you'd get a notice about that. But you don't have to join for your observation to get automatically added. And the Canada-wide project automatically am amalgamates everything from each individual one. So again, you don't have to join. Great. Uh, we have a question about sound. Uh, is there a way to add sound recordings to iNaturalist? Yeah, and I don't think I talked about that, eh? Because, yeah, I guess I was talking more about identifying as opposed to observing. But yes, especially in the last two weeks ago webinar, I definitely talked about sound recordings. And yeah, definitely sound recording is is an option within iNaturalist. Um, it's also available. So if you already have a recording on a device and bring it onto your computer, you can drag it in to uh, upload the observation the same way you would a photo. If you're using the app, when you choose to take an observation, it will ask if you want to record sound as well. So you can record sound directly in the app or add a sound that you have recorded on your uh, smartphone. Um, that's only recently come to iOS, so to, to um, um, Apple phones, so um, uh, I, iPhones, iPads. Then, so if if you don't have the latest version, maybe update to make sure that it's there, but, um, but it is there now and it wasn't before, so. Great. And can you expand on the .org and .ca sites? Do they overlap? Yeah, so I kind of talked about that, that first map that I had early on about all the different points of iNaturalist across the globe. So iNaturalist.org is kind of the, is, well, is the founder. They're the creators of iNaturalist. So that's the kind of the default anywhere in the world. And then um, we approached them in Canada to see if about making a Canadian version of it. Um, and same thing, they've done the same with Whole bunch of places mexico new zealand um portugal there's so there's a whole bunch of instances the same way canada has so our our database basically links straight through to the inaturalist.org so it's essentially one database it's just a different um entry point in a, in a in a way we encourage people here in canada to use inaturalist.ca for one because it's bilingual um so all the content is in in french and english 
and also some of the resources we've created. We've created specific resources for iNaturalist Canada that are also in French. When iNaturalist.org creates them, it's predominantly for an English audience. So some of those resources, like those videos that, um, that I, I showed, um, the .org ones aren't translated into French, the ones on .ca are. Um, also, we can more easily share the information for conservation decisions for conservation here in Canada if, if people are affiliated with iNaturalist.ca. Um, so to check that, if you're uh, logged into your account, if you go to your account settings, um, you'll be able to see if, uh, when you click through, you'll be able to see if your affiliation, affiliation and a drop down uh, list of all the different um, iterations of iNaturalist. And if you click iNaturalist.ca, it'll automatically change your account over. Nothing else changes. You could still go in through iNaturalist.ca or .org, but if your account is affiliated with us, um, it helps for us to share that data more easily. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have a question. When we've submitted a photo, is there a way to determine whether they have assisted in either a discovery or verification of a species and its range? So I didn't quite catch that. So is there a way to determine whether their observation has assisted in either a discovery or a verification of a species in a new location or new uh, range? Um, well, I remember when I showed some of the the, the maps there, when you can click on a species and see the map, you would be able to see if your observation is outside of the, the range of that species on the map. Um, now that's not to say those range maps are, are all 100% accurate to begin with, um, but it's kind of more of a general idea of where those observations are. Um, the other way, um, we're, we've started a project called Noteworthy Observations, um, and um, that we're trying to amass some of the kind of those more, um, or I think we're, they're called groundbreaking observations is the name of the project. Um, so we're trying to amass some of those more kind of noteworthy ones that are um, kind of new discoveries and that. But aside from there's a specific URL that can be kind of figured out to try and find things that are out of range, but it's um, not specifically built into iNaturalist that way. The, the best way to, to, I guess, find that is to, to come across them in publications or and, and quite often um, if your observation is a new find and someone um, from the iNaturalist community, like a, a scientist or expert, is is noting that or or using that to report on, um, they typically would message the the observer, and that's happened a number of times for a few of like few species that are either well completely new to Canada and new to an area. That's I've definitely seen that in the comments of someone saying, "Hey, great, this is a great find. Didn't know this was here," and then the kind of conversation goes from there. No, that's great. I love seeing observations like that. It's it's very very interesting. Uh, we have a question. Do photos have to be taken in the present moment or can previously taken photos be uploaded to iNaturalist? Yeah, no, anything counts as long as you know where you were. Um, that's a difficulty from older photos unless they're geotagged, some, especially depending on how long ago the photo was. Um, and if you're not exactly sure, you can create kind of a pretty large buffer of like uncertainty of like I, I was, you know, 100 meters from this point. Um, the main thing would be that when you upload your observation, you have to put the date as in the past. So especially thinking of the city nature challenge this weekend, um, what we're look we're, we're wanting people not to like take a whole bunch of old observations and then just upload them this weekend and call them uh, to be able to count. Um, it's really important to to put the date or roughly the date um, that the observation the photo was taken. It also allows you remember there's a graph of the um, the timing the seasonality of species right. So if you have your date off and you say oh I saw this monarch butterfly in um, I don't know, in March, um, you know, that kind of throws off those, those timelines. Great. We have a couple more questions. Um, we have one about life cycles. So for plants, for example, uh, can you go back to the same location? Uh, and should you make a separate observation if you see it again, or add it to the same observation if it's flowering this time? Yeah, that's good. So I would, I would definitely make a new observation. That's a, that's a good case where you might want to take multiple observations of the same species over and over. Um, and there's a cool function, and I wasn't going to get into it too much when I'm talking about basic ID or basic observing, but there's a way to link observations um, through iNaturalist. So if you're, if you're interested in that, um, there is an iNaturalist forum. Um, so I think you can get to it from your dashboard in iNaturalist when you log in. There's an option to click on the forum. Um, or you can just Google iNaturalist Forum. Um, and then you can search for that topic because there's a, there's a few threads that are basically, it's the community that talks about cool things to do with iNaturalist. 
Um, and you could you could search for that specific topic and they'll you can find out exactly how to link observations and and um, there's a few cool ways we can do that. Great. Uh, and someone was asking if they joined multiple projects and they take a photo, will all of them uh, be automatically uploaded to that project or do they have to add them individually? Yeah, it depends on the project. Most projects are set up to automatically add things. Um, kind of like I was saying how the City Nature Challenge does, you don't have to join the project. It's set up to just has a boundary and says anything within this time frame in this boundary gets automatically added. And the vast majority of projects are like that. And if those projects are like that, um, you don't, it, 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 does, it, your observation will go into all those project, projects at the same time. And it doesn't really duplicate. Basically, the project kind of points to those observations and amasses them that way and lists them. Um, there are some other projects that are called traditional projects. And those are some that um, often are a bit more specific to research where they're looking for a specific question and they can have certain observation fields. Like we have one for our turtles um, where we want to. Um, find out if the turtle was on the road, how far from the road, is there a culvert nearby? So we have those data fields we're asking people to fill out. Um, and those don't automatically add observations the same way. You have to physically click join the project and then add it to the project at the time of making the observation. Great. Uh, so it's 1.10 now. Would you like to keep going with the final few questions or do we need to? Yeah, it looks like there's still a lot of people on. If people want to stick around, there's 150 or so people still on the call. If, if if everyone's or those that are interested in hanging on, I'm I'm happy to to carry on a bit more. Great. So and we have for a all of those, I should say for those that might need to leave, um, this is being recorded, and the full um, right through to the end of how whenever we stop this will be made available. So um, you can skip right to the end and uh, just listen to these questions if you're interested and have to have to go. Great. We have a question about Bumblebee Watch. Is there a connection to a naturalist? Yeah, that's a good question. There's a lot of citizen science platforms uh, out there, um, each kind of doing their their valuable thing or their niche role as well. Um, I know the, some of the folks at Bumblebee Watch and have had conversations with them, and we've talked about how we, you know how we can integrate a little bit. Um, the fact, as I was talking about, the nuance between iNaturalist.org and .ca is the the kind of the back end programming and databases run out of uh, the California Academy of Sciences, so we don't have the liberty to kind of play around too much and uh, with the kind of the programming side of things. So to link it directly is is tough. Um, but what's been done, and I can't remember, Bumblebee Watch did for a while have a project within iNaturalist, the same way, you know, the City Nature Challenge project exists. Um, any organization can create a project and they could create a Bumblebee project that would kind of harvest in a way uh, all the observations from iNaturalist. And then they could kind of pull them into Bumblebee Watch uh, that way and, and kind of combine the data. So um, there definitely are ways to work together and, and I'm open and, and actively trying to, trying to pursue that with uh, some other citizen science platforms. Um, and it's super valuable to do. So the, the thing with iNaturalist is it's very, it's very general, right? It's, it's observations of anything, um, but it's not specific to something like Bumblebee Watch where they have um, scientific, like experts reviewing and identifying like no uh, observations and something like eBird, which is very specific to birding and it has features that iNaturalist wouldn't have just because iNaturalist is more general. No, that's great. Um, we have, I think, two more questions left. Uh, someone was asking, can they search data in the app, such as the computer software, when they're out of range of internet uh, and cell phone towers? Oh yeah, so I talked about that when we did the observing or the how to record with iNaturalist webinar. Um, so yeah, and this is what I do. I don't uh, really use the data on my phone. So when I'm out observing and I take a, a, an observation with my smartphone, um, I won't upload it right away. So there's a way to, in within your settings of your app to turn off the automatic upload. So I basically store them on my phone. And when I get back to a data connection, um, then I go through and I, I basically you edit the observation, you tap on it, you can click edit, and then you can use the image recognition software back when you have Wi-Fi to help you with the identification side of things. The other option similarly with a digital camera is, is the same as you go out with a digital camera um, and your smartphone if you want. You can take kind of a placeholder photo where you take an, uh, a distanced photo of that observation but you take a better one with uh, say a zoom on a camera and then you can kind of put those two together afterwards on a naturalist.ca. Great. 
And one of our last questions is, if species have different names used in different regions of North America, how do you resolve this uh, when you're talking about a species? They use the example of a blue grouse or sooty grouse. Yeah, that's been an a ongoing challenge with iNaturalist being a global platform, right? And, and you know, we think about within Canada, but there's the, it exists around the world and iNaturalist.org is trying to resolve this and, and certain, um, you know, Text, there's no global unified global taxonomy for most species. So when you think about what they call things in Europe versus Canada, and even within scientific names are not always congruent. So um, iNaturalist does its best to kind of come up with at least the scientific names um, working together. And it it's consistent it within itself. Um, it also has synonyms within for common names anyway. So if you do have two things, um, that have two different common names. French and English is a good example. So um, uh, if you call a species by this common name in French and a common name in English, it still links to the same scientific name. Um, so there's a way to have multiple common names um, to link to the same species within our naturalist. Great. Uh, and we have one last question about um, the use of medicinal and edible plants. Uh, is this information shared once it's been identified? So I guess in a broader sense, do you share on iNaturalist information about that plant or animal for people to learn more? Yeah, so as I mentioned, the um, obscured locations. So for something as, for example, for something that's medicinal that may be uh, at risk of being collected for its uh, medicinal values or properties, then um, those are what's the type of things that are obscured. Um, things that are obscured are shared with the provincial conservation data centers. Um, they have they, that's what they do is they manage uh, sensitive data um, and um, at risk species in Canada. So um, they how is that and then that information is used for um, when a status assessment is being carried out for species at risk, for example, um, and those kinds of things. So they are um, they house those that type of information. They have very strict guidelines as to how they use that. Um, for things that are kind of not at risk of being collected, I mean that that. Um, information, those observation information uh, is available to the public. So anybody can search through observations um, and um, bring up that, that specific observation and location, um, again, provided it's not you know, at risk of being collected. Great, and one last question just came in. Is the yeah. City Nature Challenge limited to observations within the city boundaries? Yes, uh, the city boundaries, if you look at the maps or the projects within the City Nature Challenge, the city boundaries are not that they're loose, but they're often their greater city area. So greater Toronto area or greater Ottawa Gatineau area for our example here. So they are kind of broad to trying to help engage as many people as we can. There obviously had to be a limit somewhere that was drawn. Um, and they're, they're, I think by and large, um, based on recognized uh, recognized boundaries like electoral districts. So, um, but yes, your observation would have to be within the, the boundary of the project of that city. So you can see where that boundary is if you go to the, the project page, um, the City Nature Challenge project page within iNaturalist and you click on the individual city and you'll see a map of where kind of where that boundary is. And if you're physically standing outside of that boundary, the way the, the project is defined and set up, it, it just, it, it just way won't go in and you can't force it to, you can't but go in and try and add it to the project. It won't, if it doesn't meet the conditions of that project being, i.e. being inside that boundary, then uh, it won't be added. Great, thank you so much. And thank you for the awesome presentation. Uh, and thank you to everyone who joined uh, and sorry for that little blip in uh, internet connectivity there. Yeah, thank you everyone. and I'm. Happy to take more questions uh, at different times as well. And, and there's a there's a contact, I think, um, email with the webinar invite that went out. Um, and you can always find me on iNaturalist as well. Great. I think we'll end it there. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for participating. <laughs>